please welcome back Joachim Trier, and we're also going to have Eskil Vogt and Eileen Harbour with us for the Q&A. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I will just start with um, a few questions for all of you before I open it up. Um, Joachim, this is your fourth film, and I think it, it, it represents a, a departure in several ways, even though I think there's also a continuity. Um, one obvious difference um, is the focus on um, a female character. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could maybe start with, was that a starting point? I'm curious. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. I The thing is, um, I think writing this with Eskil, it wasn't something we set out to sort of consciously do, but I think we wanted to, to liberate ourselves from many things. And we realized during the process that we had done three films in a row with primarily uh, male protagonists. Um, and I think, but, but you know, actually doing it, it felt the same. It's still a human conflict. There's still existential dilemmas, you know. It's, and I, I found that when I started working with Eile, actually, um, that I realized more in this film than anything we've done that when we write, we approach it a little bit like actors approach a part. You try to just engulf yourself and use your imagination and use your sort of association of understanding people in the process of creating a character. Um, so I don't know what to say more about that, really. I, I but but it was fun, and it, it, a part of that fun was was that that what then occurred was we needed to find a young actress, and we found Eileen, which has been one of the most amazing things for me, as personally as director, about doing this film was to work with her. Talk a bit about that. What was the what were you looking for in this role, this casting process? No, we were rather nervous actually. And you know, you you do a script, and then you realize, oh my goodness, we've written all these scenes underwater, and there are snakes, and uh, you know, how do we find a young actor who will do that and be bold enough to to do that? So we were considering doing more CGI work than perhaps it turned out to be necessary. But when we met Eileen, um, first of course, I was uh, we met hundreds of different uh, people. To, to try to find Thelma. And when Ali came in, it, it, we, I realized, it's, it's almost like a strange dating process when you start realizing that she's probably the one for the part. But you, I, I had to like test, could you deal with the pressure of it? And you came in and you did amazing versions of scenes so, that it, so much so that it started affecting the script. And we took ideas that you came in with during casting and actually put into the script and stuff. So I, I, it felt very organic actually. And uh, you, you do most of your own stunts here. And you did underwater training and seizure therapy to try to learn to, to do. <laughs> anyway, you could you could pr maybe talk a little yeah, bit I'd about that. Yeah, I'd love to hear you talk about it. What what kind of tests did they put you through? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was very exciting working on this project. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to read the script before I was casted, so I had some sense or an interpretation of who Thelma was and how this story develops. But it's so. Uh, unique and the character is um, very exciting but very challenging um, and uh, obviously I've always wanted to work with Joachim uh, I admire his work very much and um, I was just very excited to be on the audition and we after I got casted we had a lot of conversations about how the process would be and um, what was demanded of me as an actress so Yes, as you I can mention, I did uh, swimming and diving <laughs> lessons, and uh, yeah, seizure therapy to be able to portray those uh, epileptic type of seizures. Curious to hear maybe both Joachim and Eskil uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, I know you're, you're both um, very uh, like cinephilic filmmakers. I think um, I've talked to you both, and I know that you have often very uh, strong reference points um you know and and one another another departure for, uh, that i think this represents is is the move towards some um, genre i don't know if it's a it's a straight genre film but it's certainly a film that is in conversation with the horror genre uh and i'm curious whether you had particular filmmakers or films in mind well uh it wasn't like we had one reference but i i think uh, uh, we've been making movies uh, this is 
fourth film we've written, fourth, fourth feature we've written together, and and I guess the three previous could be just called dramas in a way. Yeah, you know, so, uh, but we, as you say, we're very cinephile. We we love all kinds of films, and uh, we even have a production company called Don't Look Now, named after the Nicholas Rogue uh, film. Uh, so we've always been interested in, in much more than just uh, maybe what we've shown in our previous work. And we, we were thinking with this one that maybe we could, instead of making dramas that we want, we always strive to make those uh, cinematic in a way and, and make them uh, filmic. Uh, but this time maybe w with going into the horror genre, uh, we started more in the horror genre than what the movie ended up being. But... When we when we begin there, you, we could start with more like uh, dreamlike images and uh, uh, more with the film form actually, because you, you're so allowed to experiment in that genre, and you can be more stylized, and suddenly you can have very strong images and set pieces and the musical elements of film of suspense and rhythm and colors and and so we started in that end started mm -hmm. working there and, and felt very liberated uh, and came up with a lot of ideas then of course being who we are uh, our interest in in human beings and, and characters uh, came back in and uh, and it became sort of a hybrid i guess uh, i'm not sure what kind of movie right. it is so maybe you, you can tell me but uh, <laughs> but we started uh, there as a, uh yeah that's what i can say trying to liberate ourselves a little bit as as, uh, as filmmakers yeah. but i have to add also it's you know we went through a period where I think we revisited a lot of old genre movies, 70s horror movies from Italy, or, you know, we went to, I remember a concert, uh, Thomas Robson, our producer, invited us to see um, John Carpenter play live in Oslo. And, you know, like we, we looked at a lot of... Uh, we saw Goblin live. Yeah, it's true. We saw Goblin live. We saw the Italian experimental rock band that did all of Ario, Dario Gento's soundtracks. Um, so that was kind of one thing. But then when actually doing human stories we have always been instinctively um geared towards what i would call um it's, it's a cheesy word it's a most humanist drama in the sense that you would under, try to understand all the characters and these type of genre films very often they're about you know if, if you look at italian horrors it's the man with the leather glove and and you know the razor blade slashing young women into pieces and stuff and and, and even though we were trying to to like lose our virtues of good taste it was tricky for us to create <laughs> to deal with evil you know and and in a way it's a bit of a cop out because we 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 or rather we went back to something that was more humanly oriented because we we ultimately what we like about th those genre films are the ones that are more allegorical something like um uh, the dead zone david Cronenberg, a man when touching other people can see their destiny and therefore he can't develop relationships because he understands the other too much you know that's oh that's, that's a human thing you know it's, 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 it can trigger something in you beyond just the the exercise of a stylistic murder mm -hmm. so so it was we were trying trying to find kind of a more metaphorical type of evil or or predicament of the supernatural that was an internal struggle a lack of control over the body uh, 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 this kind of dilemma of the real vil will or passions inside of human being and I don't know so, so when people we're always worried that we'll piss off like real horror fans with this one you know like it's not real evil and there's not enough killing but i guess that that's who we are i mean it's yeah. <laughs> well, let's well let's talk a bit about the that allegorical aspect and sort of the, the themes of the film i mean there's a sense in which you could say that the evil in this film is possibly religion or religious repression i don't know what if you that was something that you wanted to explore it's very much a film about repression yeah. in, in many ways. Uh, one of the starting points of the movie was the scene in the beginning where uh, where uh, Eilis character, Thelma, uh, had this complete loss of control in front of everyone uh, in the study hall. So that came, that all of the themes sort of grew out of that scene because that came to us early with also with the, with the birds hitting the, the windows at the same time. Uh, so it's uh, very much about repression and... Uh, uh, religious repression is, you know, makes that even uh, more evident um, than if she had another background. But it exists, I think, in in most uh, parent-children uh, relationship that you have 
you impose something on the children that they have to liberate themselves from. And there's so many uh, ways to, uh, uh, there's so many things that make you suppress your feelings, in, especially as a young woman in today's society. So it's, I think it's not only about religious suppression, even though that's uh, a large part of, of the story of the film. Thank you for the question, sir. It's a big question. <laughs> two big it's, questions. Uh, yeah, two big questions. Um, we try to work quite freely when we start writing and talk and talk, come up with ideas, uh, let associate, associative things come up. And what sticks very often, we don't understand until later in the process why we st that those things stuck. I think on a personal level, uh, the subject of becoming a autonomous as a human being, be becoming yourself, uh, relating to yourself with uh, compassion and love is a theme it seems like we're keep coming back to. I don't know if we're struggling with that, Eskil. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, there's something about being a freak, feeling that you don't belong, all that sense of alienation and, and that the structure and the premise of the life that you're given or, or the, the premise of what society expects from you is not always who you feel you are. I mean, those things, that, I don't know. I feel I'm surrounded by a lot of people who are struggling with that. And also, the, in this case, liberating yourself from your parents. That can be a lifelong process, whether they're loving and wonderful. And the, what, what I think in this film, in a more exaggerated way, dealing with the soft power of, of a parent. Like the father is not only evil. In a strange way, he has a logic to what he does as well, even though I don't agree with him, you know. So I, I guess these kinds of, of themes keep coming up. Um, but there's always a, a, a dialectic, I think, uh, where we also want to just play with form. What, what Eskil was talking about, make a beautiful image, a strange way of cutting something, or going to the Norwegian Opera House and filming a ballet, and could that be suspenseful? You know, just... Um, just uh, actually very to create an immersive experience of just yeah, yeah. cinema a piece what, of cinema as an object almost you know. of this film, yeah. but also the, the I, I must say the more I work also trying to find scenes that I'm curious to explore with an actor like human moments I, I think a, a great moment in the film for me as a director where I couldn't do anything was there's a scene in the middle when I when Eileen, uh, is or Th Thelma is calling her father and she's lying and saying she's been drinking when she actually can't bear to t talk about falling in love with a girl. And, and it's just one long take. And, and I remember being on set and Eskil had written something with me way back that you probably refined. The cinematographer did wonderful lighting. Isla sits in front of the camera and I'm in, next to her. And we just say action and something happens. <laughs> and, and it's kind of you doing a lot of that, Eileen. And I thought that was, you know, just I didn't want to cut in that. I just wanted to put that in the film. So I think also more and more uh, in the process of creating early stage ideas, it's, it's trying also to, to think about what would be exciting to do on set, what would be fun to do with actors. That's, that's also a motivation these days, I think, in what we do. Yes, yeah. What to take away from it? Yeah, what, what I, I, I can't comment on that. I guess that's what I'm curious to hear. What do people take away from it? <laughs> it's a question about the sort of internal logic of the film and the rules of genre and what you know, deciding what was and wasn't possible. Well, uh, the process was in the beginning we just uh, we were completely free in just imagining a lot of stuff. And then, of course, some rules start to impose themselves. And some of the rules we want to be evident to the spectator. So we try to communicate that, those in a more verbal or direct way. And some we just feel confident that they can be below the surface and people will feel the logic. So we have our explanations of what happens and, and why some things can't happen and why some things can. And, uh, well, it's hard for us to, I mean, but when you make this kind of movie, you kind of open up for interpretation. So if we just say, come with our, uh, come out with our explanations, we kind of kill the film for some people. <laughs> That's uh, in my experience. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I can tell you afterwards what my, <laughs> my interpretation is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, question about two yeah, male writers. Yeah, no, no, I, I understand the question, and it's it's probably relevant, but I don't know. I think we've written by now quite a f lot of different characters that um, 
are quite different from us. And I think that there is a, a leaning in, in this sort of appreciation of art these days be, through the media. And I'm not saying that that's what you're asking us uh, to connect the secondary narrative about your personal connection to your material. And the thing is that that process I find to be so ultimately complicated and so ultimately an ongoing thing that we're at least I feel quite unclear about sometimes. At times I do. I think I know I'm doing something and other times I don't. So in this case, um, I, I gender prohibits me from having had the lesbian experience, but I <laughs> do understand something about having a complicated relationship to, to love and, and sustaining or creating relationships. And I don't know. I, and I think uh, imagination and empathy shouldn't be underestimated in the creative process either, uh, if that makes sense. I, it's very hard to justify sometimes why you do what you do. And I don't, in a strange way, need, feel I need to. But, but yeah, no, I, it, it's a subject matter. I, I think there's also a, a motivation in a way, because in Nordic cinema, at least, a lot of stories about um, gay love has been between men. For some reason, there's the story of, of two women falling in love is, is quite rare where I come from. And I, I, I won't say, I don't know if it's the same in America. I, I don't have the overview. You know, I watch a lot of movies. But uh, we found that kind of be an original story to tell. I don't know. This question is, what does voyeurism then come into it? Sure. Yeah, and I, the, the uh, we wanted to make uh, uh, an empowering story about an empowered woman uh, who found a liberation, yet not try to idealize her and only make her good. You know, it, it's um, it's a tricky thing. And of course, the idea of male gaze, which I feel that you're referring to, it's tricky. I'm a man in my early 40s, and I'm filming young women um, going through something erotic. And, and now I I hope I did it right. I hope I did it on an eye level of the. Um, kind of fascination that Thelma's character feel for for that liberating experience of falling in love with a girl and you know it's up to others to judge really but it's of course a relevant question but the thing is I, I also think it's dangerous to create art from a position of worry and shame um, I don't create films primarily to try to send out as a blockbuster to make money. I actually, it's a very, very personal thing for me, what, what we do. Um, and I try in my own life to be as honest as I can about my tastes, my curiosities, my passions for, for what I want to look at in a specific way. So, yeah, I, it's, you know, that, that's how I create. And it's very hard to justify it, actually. Yeah, I, just I'll, I'll start and then maybe yeah. you can jump in as well. Um, I think in a way what, what we realized we were doing was to make kind of um, a sinister, uh, ultimate tragic family story. Uh, I mean, when I grew up, I admired David Lynch a lot, and I still do. I think he's one of the greatest directors of all time. And the way that he took Americana or what I presume must have been for a lot of Americans, the feeling of home, um, and change it into something more complex. In, in his films have both political but also deep psychological um, aspects to them that we admire. And, and we, without thinking about that until later, I think a lot of the imagery in, in Thelma is, is riffing on uh, the Norwegian values of family and nature and walking in the woods with dad and like a lot of stuff that we, in a strange way, perverted. And I think the, our motivation was was more than anything just to um, be very open to as associations we had and, and, and these kind of nightmarish visions almost that we talked yeah, about. Yeah, I, I think most of those images come from, I mean, fears that I think that's why we came up with them because they corresponded with some of our own fears of uh, being trapped on the water uh, or, or the baby under the ice. I, 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 I'm a father, I have two small children. And just after my first son was born, I had a nightmare. Uh, he was a baby, so he couldn't run. But in a dream, he, we were on the top of a, of a tall building and he was running from me and over the edge. And I ran towards the edge uh, to see that he had fallen down on the street below. And then a car ran him over just to make sure that he was double dead. <laughs> and, I, and I woke up uh, uh, and I, I think like the baby under the ice is like the ultimate parent nightmare. And, and that's why it uh, felt so strong to us. And the, that is so close, but you can't do anything to, to save him. And, uh, and then it corresponds with other elements in the movie and it just feels like 
this is right for this film. We need to uh, need to have it in. If you don't mind, let me just ask one very quick final question to Joachim. Um, two years ago, we had here as a guest um, the Norwegian writer, Karl Ove Knausgaard, who um, we have a series where we invite writers to, to pick films. He picked a film by Lars von Trier, The Idiots, to talk about. And then the Q&A asked him about uh, what he thinks of Norwegian cinema, and he singled out as what he thought was you know, the, the bright young talent and his favorite working Norwegian filmmaker was you. And I heard that the two of you are now working together on a project. Could you say a bit about it? Yeah, it's, that's true. That's, that was very kind of him to say. Uh, he invited uh, me and my brother, Emil Trier, who's a documentary filmmaker, to follow a process where Karlovi is um, curating a big exhibition at the Norwegian Munk Museum, you know, Edward Munk, the painter of the scream and so forth, and to, where he has chosen late Munk paintings that have almost never been shown before. And now I hear that some of those paintings are going to be shown at the Met here in New York. So the process of that documentary has been about really the theme of uh, the, the process of art in life and how... Uh, um, uh, artists age really but but the, the injury I, so I learned a lot about monk like I jumped straight in and, and tried to to learn about that and I, I yeah I, I look forward to to finishing that film later this autumn it's quite a combination Knaus garden monk yeah, and no, you it's, so it's fun. Uh, well, I hope we can bring you back for that uh, oh, I would love to come. so uh, thank you to all of you for being here and thank you for the film thank you thank you